Welcome. Welcome, guys. To another episode of Eigen Bros. Today, we were talking about sort of a primer into uh, string theory. Mm -hmm. So we give some good uh, information. It's a, it's a slightly shorter podcast, mm -hmm. I guess, because I guess I went on a factual tirade. <laughs> no, it's good. No, it's good because it, it, it lays out the a survey. It's mm -hmm. a survey of string theory, just briefly kind of going over some, some stuff. Uh, we talk about renormalization what it means to yeah. be to have a gauge theory, quote mm -hmm. unquote, all these all these big terms, right. manifold stuff. You know, you see all this, yeah, all this yeah. stuff. Uh, the different types of string theories uh, mm -hmm. we kind of briefly discussed, and um, and yeah, I'm I'm kind of surprised we we ended up talking almost 50 minutes about this because <laughs> it you, we as physicists we we this is a science. Um, how would you say? A, a popular, how would you say, sci pop? Yeah, it's a really popular th thing within pop the science and within popular science. Mm -hmm. um, but it's so out of our wheelhouse too. Also, so um, this isn't really this because this isn't taught in, in in normal coursework. Yeah, yeah. And if you're not a string theorist, or like if you're not even a, mostly if you're not a, a quantum field theorist, like you're not going to really know much about string theory. Like right. me and Juan are, comp are condensed matter physicists, so mm -hmm. this is way out of our wheelhouse. Right. Completely out of the scope of what we normally do. Yeah. But this is still nonetheless something that's interesting. If you're a physicist, fundamentally, you, you still interest, you're still yeah. interested in yeah. this kind of stuff. Exactly. So, um, so hopefully we did it justice. Hopefully we did it justice, yeah. but, but look out for a series. We will have probably a discussion series. This doesn't warrant just one episode. That would yeah. be silly. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, this is the first of many, more than likely. And, uh, and if you like what you hear, don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and share. Mm -hmm. And then Terrence will f tell us to follow us on social. Yes, guys. So check us out at eigenbros.com, the main website. Check us out on Twitter, eigenbros. And then we have eigenbros on Instagram. And then also eigenbros2 on TikTok. Mm -hmm. And we will see you guys there. Two, one. Yeah. We're live. What's up, people? Today, we are talking about string theory aka Ooh. aka bling theory <laughs> our theory bling, bling. in our theory of everything <laughs> now nah, but uh <laughs> no nah, but uh today we actually are talking about string theory and it's yeah, yeah. it's a topic that has needed that we've needed to discuss mm -hmm. controversy show, controversially <laughs> um because we've we've alluded to it multiple times and uh it's just a, one of these topic in physics that that never leave uh, the um, how would you say the, the like the background of discussion or, yeah exactly uh -huh. yeah 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 it's one of these relevant things that people you know we've made many jokes about string theory <laughs> shit on it mm -hmm. you know uh, experimentalists love to shit on string theorists mm -hmm. because it's basically they're basically uh, glorified mathematicians we'll say mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but uh, at the end of the day you know I gotta say I respect string theory a little more after uh, researching it. Yeah, so where 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 does where does it all begin? Where does string theory uh so back in the nine and back in the nineteen seventies, a time where uh people were wearing um what is it? Hippie attires. Yeah, hippie attire with their uh <laughs> bell bottom their, jeans and, and their boot flared uh leather cut boots, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Hey, what a good time for music, but um True. But was it motive did did the hippie sort of L S D acid kind of generation take uh, <laughs> effect physics in this way? I think it might have. It had to have because this the vibration is trippy stuff? as hell. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, so basically string theory is, uh, it all began in around the 1970s. Mm -hmm. So a guy named, I think, Venenciano, I, I believe I'm so saying his name correctly, um, came up with some theory that basically spawned the birth of string theory. It wasn't string theory that he came up with, but people took a hold of it and string theory kind of fell out or that idea came to be mm -hmm. because of his theory. Um, and uh, basically what string theory is, is it's essentially just kind of what it sounds like. It's vibrating strings. So typically physicists, we like to use points, you know, lines, circles, that kind of thing, those easy geometric shapes. We even mentioned that in the last podcast, how I try to make everything into a point and a line or a, you know, yeah. a circle. Yeah. Um, but with string theory, it's basically saying that the fundamental, uh, I guess, con uh, constituents of matter, so like quarks and leptons and bosons, they're all made of strings. So tiny little vibrating strings. So if you imagine a 
typical like electron as you see in the textbook the little blue sphere <laughs> instead of just being a blue sphere that blue sphere is now actually being created because it's actually a vibrating string mm-hmm. so yeah I, I joke often that if um they they physicists went with string theory because they were uh, they didn't want to be memed into obscurity by calling it spring theory because everything is <laughs> according to physics everything is a harmonic oscillator yeah it's kind of an inside joke of physicists like yeah. you're just doing what is it like um and an expert in physics is just someone who can extrapolate higher and higher orders of harmonic oscillators. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, so uh, no spring theory. They they yeah. switched it up a little bit. <laughs> yeah, I mean, and and funny enough, I think one of the first toy model examples is is a string. Is a string is a spring in quantum mechanics. How you can get string theory by approximating this string, but it's really a it shows that the harmonic oscillator with quantized energies comes out from approximating mm. it it's a, it's an interesting little I, I forget which book i read it from but uh it's a, it's one of these uh one of these uh textbooks that they use for uh teaching undergraduates uh yeah. quantum mechanics i think it's towards the end where they're like hey guys get look at this cool thing um they try to suck you into becoming a string theorist theory. <laughs> <laughs> sorry guys we'll 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 lay off the uh, but string it's theory but deal. it's interesting it's interesting I, I so like so it came out of the 70s and i'm sure around that time you had a lot of um very talented geniuses right you had, you had yeah. a lot of brains coming at this theory um do you do you know do you happen to know what kind of i guess what what was the the one catalyst you would say that on your research of it, like that made string theory kind of blossom. Yeah. Well, let me think. So I think the big thing that kind of really started selling people on string theory was the whole graviton. Mm -hmm. So for those of you who are not familiar, um, we have a standard model of particle physics and it's composed of things like quarks, leptons and bosons. Uh, inclu- and I think I guess neutrinos are, are leptons as well, and that's and those are basically the particles that compose uh, comp- compose like protons and neutrons, mm-hmm. electrons, all those things. And one of these hypothetical particles called the graviton, it's a spin two particle, a bosonic particle, um, actually kind of fell out from string theory. Um, with the right terms, you know, if you have the right energies in these certain parameters um they they came to find that this theory was actually producing gravity naturally so something that looked like gravity at least naturally and that was a huge um win compared to any other real theory because all the previous theories you know it's kind of you kind of get stuck where gravity is this separate thing and you have electromagnetic magnetic force the weak force and the strong force tie up really nicely together. Um, and I think that's covered in things like Yang Mills theory. Mm-hmm. Um, but the gravity somehow doesn't ever fit in. So when, um, I forget who it was that discovered this, but when gravity fell out of string theory, that's when people started really flocking towards it mm-hmm. and they realized, Oh, this could be the one yeah. because it literally is necessary. It's a, it's a consequence of the theory. And usually when things are just falling out of theories and they're matching, um, to other parts of well-established knowledge, that's when people are going to start taking things more seriously. Mm-hmm. Um, it kind of reminded me of the whole Dirac equation, like Dirac's equation became convincing because he was trying to basically find a relativistic um, equation for um, quantum mechanic or for yeah, quantum yeah. particles, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. But his theory actually, spin actually fell out of that. Yeah. So you needed to have spin in order to make it work. Mm-hmm. So you started to get these things for free that were explained by the theory Whereas beforehand, you had to actually like ham fist these things. Like if you wanted spin in quantum mechanics, you had to just throw in a spin term, right? But with Dirac's equation, it actually fell out of the theory. So that's a similar, it's a very similar thing that happened with string theory. It's deeper and richer, explains a lot more fundamentally from, as opposed to shoehorning things in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So string theory was is pretty interesting. Um, and over time, it got more and more developed. Um, of mm-hmm. course, you know, the big... There's some big names involved with this, um, one of them being Edward, Edward Witten, mm-hmm. um, String Daddy, as we call him. Uh, <laughs> he's, uh, he's a beast, and basically he was the guy that unified a bunch of th- string theories, and this was about in 1995, so they were going at it for quite a while. Um, 
there's some other guys that are famous, famously involved with string theory that I didn't know about. Um, uh, Nima Arkani Hamed, uh-huh. he's famous from string theory. Um, so does Penrose. Oh, really? Twisters, uh, right? I don't know if that has to do with string theory. I think it does. Does it? I'm okay. Say it. Well, super strings, I know that. But. Okay. That's out of what I studied, so yeah, I don't yeah. really know. Um, there's another guy whose name is slipping my mind. It starts with an H. Um, anyway, if I can remember it, I'll bring it up again. He'll post, but. It. He'll post it as a brief image <laughs> on uh, the the podcast. But, um, but yeah, so there's a group of these people working at this. It's, do you know? Do you know? Is this... This theory is, from what I know, purely, purely a theoretical. Um, how would you say, model exercise? Okay, right. Continue on. Maybe the, you're this, right. This, this seems like it's. There's a proposition that maybe you know maybe we can approximate uh, the universe as strings as opposed to point particles, and then you kind of evolve the theory in a more fundamental way. You test Schrodinger's equations. And you kind of, I think I think there was a video you sent me to 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 look at that was um, that said that the correction for electromagnetism was included in for gauges allowed mm-hmm. allowed gauge mm-hmm. um, variance, but that there there was a proposition that Schrodinger's equation should remain gauge invariant, meaning that if you change it. Depending on the scenarios, it should look the same, or the or the energies we get, we sh- should look the same. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, but out of this came out um, a more fundamental approach, which was like, oh, now you're coupling quantum and E and M um, in a meaningful way, and then you, you, little by little, you get other interesting results, like gravitons coming out and stuff like that. Um, well, one of the interesting things about string theory that also makes it powerful is it is a gauge invariant. So mm-hmm. th- string theory is like kind of a combination of two types of math in some ways. It's it's a conformal theor- field theory as well as a gauge theory. And basically that just means that it's a quantum field theory. So conformal the- field theory has to do with quantum field theory. Mm-hmm. So let's say if you guys are, you know, trying to be up and coming physicists and you want to l- work on leading edge, you know, theory of every t- everything type stuff, you'll probably want to become a field theorist or something along those lines. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's because uh, the real... I guess discrepancy right now with combining all of the different regimes of physics is the fact that we're trying to get a field that's uh, I'm sorry, a theory that is consistent with quantum physics and general relativity, right? That's where the gap kind of lies. Um, But anyway, um, uh, string theory is a conformal field theory with a gauge theory. So the gauge theory basically tells you all the symmetries that are involved with um, the differential equations that are involved with that particular string theory. So when I say that particular string theory, there's actually five different types. So there's a type one string theory, which has to do with um, these things called closed and open loops. So Mm -hmm. if you think of the string, right, Mm -hmm. you can think of it as like a little loop. So like the string is now connected back from on its vertices. And that has to do with closed and open loops. So you can also have an open loop where it's just like an actual line where there's two actual points mm-hmm. at each end. Um, and that's type one string theory. It's a super symmetric theory, which I can get into a little bit later. And then there's also type 2A and type 2B string theory, which is also which is um, a super string theory as well. Um, but these ones have to do with closed loops. So one of the clo- so these only have closed loops. Mm-hmm. So they can't have any open loops as in type one. Um, but the closed loops in type one and type two A are they have no chirality, mm-hmm. and then in type two B there is a chiral nature to those two loops. And chirality has to do with like intrinsic spin stuff, right? I believe so. Yeah, I don't yeah. know for sure. I won't say that for sure because I didn't know. I didn't research enough to see yeah. exactly what the chirality meant in this case. Yeah. But it means handedness if you want to think generally, right? Yeah, like yeah. we have a right hand and a left hand. Yeah. yeah. So a right hand doesn't look the same. Um, you know, in certain systems, like mm. handed this matters. Yes. Um, so that's the type A and the type B for uh, type two. I'm sorry, that's type two A and type two B for uh, super mm-hmm. string theory. And then there's the final um, last two super string theories, which are the heterotic string theories. Um, and those have to do with a mixture of bosonic string theory with um, super string theory. So bosonic string theory is the not even really considered a, a string theory because it's not um, consistent. 
but it's a way to derive string theory in a very simple way because you're only dealing with bosons. Mm -hmm. But of course, in real life, we have fermions, right? So that's where the super string, the supersymmetry comes in. Mm -hmm. So that's why type 1, type 2A, and type 2B, and then the heterotic string theories, HO and HE, they all use super supersymmetry because you have fermions in real life as well. So then the heterotic string theories also use closed loops, but they're... Um, the, the difference is they have a they have this weird hybrid between bosonic string theory and um, and uh, what is it called uh, supersymmetry. Mm -hmm. So all those string theories, you're just like that's a lot of goddamn string theories. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so there's five major super string theories, and mm -hmm. supersymmetry is kind of the way to go in terms of string theory. Um, but then you're like, that's too many theories, right? We need one. Yeah. So then that's where big uh, big daddy string. String Daddy came in, Ed Witten, yeah. he ties them all up. So he basically came up with M-theory that created this 11-dimensional theory that encompassed all of them. So all of those things he could show that they went to the 11-dimensional um, M-theory in certain limits. And then they all became this weird unified M-theory, which is why another reason why people got excited. So he caused the second string revolution, as they say. G-U-T. Yeah, yeah, unified theory. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The gut. <laughs> yeah. There's a gut feeling that physicists have. This has to be true. <laughs> yeah, but it was pretty crazy. It was a wild, um, a wild thing to to basically um, unite all of those string theories, and that's why also Ed Witten has the reputation as like one of the smartest guys to ever live. Yeah. Even if string theory is not right, I mean, it's just a, a feat to be able to, to brilliance tie all those together. Yeah, it yeah. is. It is living legend, Edward Witten. Mm -hmm. um, who Shout is out on respect? Who, who is on Twitter? He is <laughs> surprisingly. Ted. He is some for some reason he is <laughs> discovered by the Eigen Bros. I don't think anybody else knew. Yeah, at least he, he, his follower count went up a lot as we as I put it out there that he was on Twitter. Yeah. I'm just gonna say I'm not gonna take full credit. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But he only tweets about politics and anti-Trump. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it'd be interesting to see. I mean, he lives in New Jersey. I think he studies at the Princeton. Uh, the what is it? The uh, the Advanced Studies Institute, I believe. I'm not sure. It's where all like Sounds the right. it's where the guys that just get paid to do research, mm -hmm. the highest levels of the of, big boys of intellect, yeah, and and big boys big, and gals, big bills and gals, yeah. yeah. There's it's it's pretty split evenly, I think. Oh Almost. really? I think so. In gender, you mean? I think in gender. Oh okay, it's nice. A, I was like, wow, this is uh, it's 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 impressive that that you know that we're able to kind of keep. And even disparity, because like there's a lot of women physicists that are slept on, I imagine, mm -hmm. in, in a mm -hmm. male dominant field. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but sure. um, Emmy Nurther. Yeah, Emmy. Classic Nurther. example. Classic example. That's, yeah. that's a while ago, though. But. That is, that is. But she's also a legend in yeah, her own yeah. respect. The yeah, Ed, Ed Witten, um, M theory, and then we get Grand Unified Theory, and that GUT is probably what almost twenty, fifteen years old. No, twenty five years old. Which one? The M theory. GUT. Well, GUT just means Grand Unified Theory, yeah. right? But he made he he basically kind of no, you don't no. No, because the thing is, if you have Grand Unified Theory, then it's complete, right? The definition of Grand Unified Theory basically means that it's a complete theory of everything. Oh, so his his M theory doesn't no, doesn't it just it just unifies all the string theories. Oh, gotcha. And I think the string theories are considered. I, this is don't quote me on this because it's actually I'm not entirely sure. More this, research but I think is. Needed. Is needed, yeah. But I think it's considered an effective field theory. Okay. So effective mean it only works within certain energy regimes. Gotcha. But ideally, you want a theory that works in all regimes. And I think this is because of uh, renormalization problems. So this is another key word that some of you may be familiar who are physicists and others who are laymen won't know, but it's kind of a big concept in physics. So renormalization has to do with, it's basically like a shorthand where you're, as Feynman called it, like sweeping under the rug these infinities. Yes. So... It's kind of a bullshit thing to do. It's a very mathematical mm -hmm. trickery type thing to do, but it works and experimentally has been confirmed in some ways. This so is what separates, like, eh, this is what it, separates it mathematicians from physicists. Yeah. Really. It really does. We have the beautiful thing of being able to check in real life. So we're just like, eh, if it works, then, you know. It explains it somehow. So, <laughs> Like, I'm satisfied as long as it works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so what they do basically is, um, if you guys are familiar with Feynman diagrams, um, in Feynman diagrams, you have these certain um, areas where you have these energy terms that actually blow up to infinity. Yes. 
Um, and what you have to do is you have to put this kind of fudge factor reason renormalization thing in here where you're getting rid of these infinities so that your theory will be more tame mm -hmm. and you can actually still do the calculations properly. Mm -hmm. Long story short, I'm not going to get much into it because also I don't know enough about renormalization to talk too confidently on it. Yeah, it's a mathematical process. I think I think a lot of theories fail the renormalization test. I think, um, for instance, the Bohmian mechanics uh, interpretation, I think it fails renormalization. Okay, so that's the Bohmian mechanics is has to do with quantum mechanics. It's an pilot, interpretation of quantum mechanics. Yeah, pi the pilot wave theory, quote unquote. Right. I think it fails to be renormalized. Okay. Um, there are quite a number of theories that don't pass that test, which is interesting. Like, th there are some theories that did pass. I think the first test is like invariance. You're mm. like you're like seeing if things are invariant under certain transformations. Right. And this can be related to gauge theory. Right. Like if you have gauge invariance, it means that it doesn't really your your system doesn't care, your Lagrangian doesn't care what coordinate system you're in. Right. It's just like if you put it in spherical coordinates, you put it in whatever coordinates, it's always gonna have this certain symmetry to it. Yeah. The answers or the energies are gonna come out the same. Yeah. Yeah. Probably up to certain there's certain like you get introduced to to gauges if you want to study this in a more I guess uh how would you say rudimentary level mm -hmm. you can you can look at uh griffith's e and m i think he's he tackles uh yeah a couple gauges yeah that's the first time i've ever been same. introduced to it same. yeah but uh i think and that's the only time i've ever been introduced right, to it. right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah yeah same here that's <laughs> so was like oh this is kind of powerful you know it is it is but you you can play with these like e and m models of gauges and stuff and you get to see what it means for something to be gauge invariant mm -hmm. and he he gives you like a a a gauge potential and you're you just play with the math and you're like oh i guess it didn't really change the answer yeah and it's yeah. actually a way to um get um to decouple the electric field and the magnetic field mm -hmm. um for those of you who are studying enm you know if you're like an undergraduate there's a there's some cool stuff you can learn from that because you can see oh i can actually you, you see in maxwell's equations you see the e and the b's are all coupled together but with gauge theory you can actually decouple them yes in a, an cool. interesting way it's very cool um so so yeah, it, it that's if that's if renormalization. Well, renormalization is still we don't deal with that until you get to basically graduate school level, um, like, like quantum electives. field theory and things. QFT, yeah. you know, I, I took quantum many body stuff like that where you're actually dealing with Feynman diagrams or the introduction of Feynman diagrams. Oh, so you know about renormalization? I do. Renormalization. I do yeah, okay, yeah. maybe you could put some more insight there because I, I don't mean, know you, anything. that's pretty much what it is okay yeah <laughs> so I, I have i for the for the audience i have not taken um quantum many body mm -hmm. systems or qft mm -hmm. which are they're both pretty related yeah um so for me this is all just kind of just new research that i've yeah. done and it's not that in depth for a podcast so. right but no i mean in in function it's exactly what you're saying it's this mm -hmm. uh it's the act of mathematically uh sort of sweeping under the rug like yeah. you're saying or, or hand waving away infinities uh, in a mathematically allowable way yes exactly yeah. through yeah. the use of Feynman diagrams yes. this is this is what makes Feynman diagrams so useful and uh, Feynman diagrams are like these interesting logical set of rules diagrammatic mm -hmm. logical set of rules that it's literally pictures of lines and yeah. squiggly lines yeah. and stuff it's kind of cool I th and I th I want to say that he actually invented them I, I know Feynman experimented with psychedelics. I know that. I know that because I oh, read. Oh, you know he did. I read his autobiography or his book. I don't even have to read it. I just know. <laughs> um, so I know that he did. He 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 played around with psychedelics. So I I wonder if this was motivated by that because there's a lot. I mean, this theory was born from the 70s, and mm -hmm. uh, I know that at the time, people that were experimenting with um, psychedelics and hallucinogens, powerful hallucinogens. They, they people get this sense that they have the universe is like. I have I have friends. I've never taken psychedelics, but I have friends that when they take it, they say, "Oh, I have one friend in particular who's never studied physics, and he's like, dude, I felt like the universe was just vibrations. Like he could see. He says he could see the vibrations and stuff. And so I was it's like, very Bill Hicksian." <laughs> sure yeah but he's like i felt everything like all it felt like waves man and i was just like interesting mm -hmm. it's almost like these people that are not don't know anything about physics they're like peeling back this like processing layer that the brain does where it you know our brains are four-year analysis <laughs> they take in frequencies and then generate them into meaningful 
images and stuff. It, it it's almost like you're peeling back that layer. And I wonder if a lot of these physicists were like, it's interesting to think, let's think about the universe as a f- made a fundamentally mm-hmm. vibrating, like oscillating part. Um, and you're saying due to psychedelics. I wonder. I wouldn't be shocked. I mean, I wouldn't be shocked. Not that I'm going to say that that was the only way to come up with it, yeah. but I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah. If uh, Here's a quick question. If I've never seen a good string theory documentary, but if you folks that are listening right now, if you do know of any good ones, like drop it down below. We'll pin it. Because um, I do want to see a complete history if there's poss- if it's possible that mm. there's a... There's several on YouTube I've yeah. noticed, but I didn't actually... The only one I looked at was these, this... Um, it's not a documentary, but I looked at an interview with Ed Witten mm-hmm. in about, it was in the year 2000. Yeah. Um, so it's five years after he did the M theory unification. Yeah. And he basically does a, re- a really nice layman, as layman as you can possibly do. He did a very good job of trying to make it as layman friendly as possible of what string theory is and some of the motivations and why it's so powerful. Mm-hmm. It's a great, it's a great interview. Um, I would definitely check that out. It probably comes up first when you just type in Ed Witten string theory. Yeah. If not, we'll post it in the, the comment box below. Yeah. Um, the so 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 that timeline is it's a very quick timeline you're saying from what you saw it's the 70s and then we get to 20 years of work or so mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and then we produce and we get to m theory the modern version yeah they go ham on it basically yeah. um and yeah so then they they just start cranking it out basically and coming up with shit like oh for the graviton to exist we need 10 dimensions now <laughs> or 10, 10, 10 dimensions plus time. Um, so 11 dimensions total. And then they start doing things like, Oh, well for fermions to exist, we need supersymmetry. Mm-hmm. Um, and then it just gets more and more untenable. So string theory is cool, but the problem now arises from, okay, why do, why do experimentalists uh, talk shit about string theory? Um, because now you're starting to add things that are more and more higher levels of abstraction and theory based on no evidence. It's all based on making the mathematics and the theory work. So this is where you can get into a little trouble with physics. So you have to start making testable things, right? So, okay, okay. so the string theory claims 10 dimensions, all right? So then you say, well, we live in a society that's obviously three dimensions plus time, if you want to include that. It's kind of like a, it's not a spatial dimension, so it's a, it's a time dimension. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can say, okay, we live in a four-dimensional space-time. Right. Um, But then where are the other, you know, remaining seven dimensions? Right. I only see four. Where's where's the 11 that we need? So what they do. It's a liberal hoax. (laughs) (laughs) QAnon. Fake news. Fake news. Fake news. Right. Yeah. (laughs) But so, yeah, that's that begs the question. Right. Mm -hmm. So then what physicists do is they say they're curled up dimensions. So now I'm kind of like, well, what the fuck is this? Curled up dimensions, what do they even mean? Yeah. But now it's grown on me. I'm kind of like, okay, I get it. There's some legitimacy to this, I believe. So, or at least it sounds like a good, it sounds like a good remedy. So what that means is the dimensions are so small that basically it's irrelevant to us within our um, length scales, right? So this is where the Planck length and things like this and Planck time and Planck mass start to come in. So... I'm sure some people are probably familiar with that. Um, Planck, Planck time and Planck length. I even did a tweet on Planck length. Um, it's like showing the limits or the edges of what um, what what our physics are. So basically, Planck length, for example, is a quantity that was invented purely on dimensional analysis. So some people might be motiv- might think it's some motivated quantity that's quantizing space. The Planck length is the smallest distance. I had this misconception even when I was a, you know, beginning undergraduate. I was like, oh, the mm-hmm. Planck length is this fundamental smallest length, and I was like, oh, that's so cool. I don't wonder how they got that. But literally, it's not anything that deep. It's literally just dimensional analysis using these kind of sacred, these kind of sacred constants that we know of, mm-hmm. the speed of light c gravitational universal gravitational constant mm-hmm. g big g um and then Planck's constant mm-hmm. so these constants show up constantly these constants show show up a lot in physics mm-hmm. so then it begs the question that are these like these really weird fundamental constants so Planck mm-hmm. rearranged these constants in such a way to give you the right dimensions of length um and that's where the Planck length comes in and the same for Planck time and Planck mass but anyway that's relevant because in these curled up dimensions, they're so small that they're within the regimes around those like Planck scale 
or Planck lengths. Right. So we can't actually interact with them. Mm-hmm. It's too small for us to see. Um, and the dimensions are curled up because all six, uh, six or seven of those, seven of those dimensions, I guess, are all curled up so small that humans have no interaction with them. And an example that people give you of what that could look like is a curled up dimension. For instance, if we see that in our macro scale, imagine if you if you see a um, if you see a fishing line. So let's say you have a fishing line in front of you, and an ant is walking that fishing line. To us, that just looks like the ant is in one dimension, right? He's only going on one dimensional line, either forward or back on the line. But let's say if you switch your reference frame to the ant, the ant can literally see himself on two dimensions because now he can go around that. So he has an angular component to his dimensions. Mm -hmm. So you can say that to the perspective of humans, our length scale is too big to see that second dimension. So literally that's a curled up dimension, that, that extra dimension of angle being able to go around the fishing line is a curled up dimension gotcha so that's the kind of thing that happens as well in string theory gotcha. when you're considering these um extra dimensions of space mm-hmm. space time it's compacted in this like in in what look depending on the reference well it takes a certain stroke of genius to see that yeah that yeah there are more dimensions compacted into this seemingly trivial dimensionality right? yes yeah. and these are and these are um uh, mathematically um, called these Kalabi Yao manifolds. So mm-hmm. you might be familiar with that as well. There's these real trippy no. looking like manifold. I've <laughs> okay. seen the pictures. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm sure you've probably seen yeah. them. There's these real trippy looking like they look like crinkled Dynamic. up sheets of yeah. like paper. And manifolds are just basically fancy words of saying like surfaces. So it's this really weird crinkled up you know surface, and those are the things that exist at those super small like Planck scales. Um, but the problem is now with string theory is they're trying to figure out one of the things is which Kalabi Yao manifold actually is the one that um, exists within string theory. And unfortunately, they can come up with so many. There's like on the order of like 10 to the 500 wow. possible ones. So this is a problem of string theory where we're running into again of now the now the theory is becoming untenable. There's, not, there's a lack of testability because mm-hmm. you can't just see what Kalabi Yao manifold it is because there's so many. And then somehow come up with an experimental, um, what do you call it? Experimental uh, constraints. Constraints. Yeah, mm-hmm. exactly. Mm-hmm. So string theory has some testability problems. Um, now the other one has to do with supersymmetry. So supersymmetry is one of these things I'm sure you're familiar with it. One, I'm sure a lot of the uh, audiences as well because of the LHC. So the LHC is a large hydrogen collider that was looking for the Higgs boson, right? One of the other things, the other projects that they considered it for was for supersymmetric particles. So they were hoping that they would find these supersymmetric particles from string theory as just an extra, you know, extra icing on the cake after they've already found the Higgs. So they, mm-hmm. you know, popped the champagne bottles and all that once they found the Higgs and now like, all right, the the projects paid, the projects paid for itself. Now we can find supersymmetric particles. Yeah. But lo and behold, nothing has been discovered. No supersymmetric particles have been discovered. So that is another problem experimentally. So the nice thing about that for string theorists is though um, the energy scales are not so constrained to just the energy scales of what the LHC operates in. Mm-hmm. So we can have the supersymmetric particles exist in higher energy scales. Right. Um, but... That's another problem, right? Because we want more constraints experimentally mm-hmm. or else we're just like, what is this theory? So it's literally a theory of everything because it can just be anything. <laughs> you know, it can be everything. Yeah. Um, so so the, the, the problem there is now we need constraints within what can the supersymmetric particles, what um, energies do they exist in? Mm-hmm. And you need those. And basically, I guess I should describe a little bit more what supersymmetric particles are. Yes, yes, please. Um, so basically, supersymmetric particles, they're there as a way to get rid of some of those infinities within the theory. Okay. And that means that every particle that we know of in the standard model also has a supersymmetric particle. Mm-hmm. So if you're a boson, you have a supersymmetric fermion. And if you're a fermion, you have a supersymmetric boson. So that's where they get those weird names. Like you've probably seen them like protons. They co- Or I'm not sorry, not protons. So it'd be quarks. So that, like if you have a... um. A quark, they call them squarks. 
mm. for the super symmetric cork. Mm. And then you could get even more fined up where you can say like a down cork is a down or something. I don't know. And then they also have um, the leptons are from as well. So they'll have sleptons. And then the bosons, they'll add eno to the ends. So if you have like a photon, the super symmetric version of a photon is a photino. So they're looking for all these super symmetric partners, but that just means that now you've literally just doubled the standard model. So you should be seeing some of these particles in nature. And so far we've seen zero. So <laughs> that's a problem. <laughs> yeah. Interesting. Do you, did you read on how like they would detect them? Is it, they, are they supposed to be attainable using, are, are they in the, the resolution of the LHC that has, that that's, has? that's the thing is the theory is so non-constrained energy wise. Um, the resolution can, it, it may not be within the resolution of the LHC. Mm -hmm. It could be in higher orders of energy, right? So they're hoping that, you know, I think the LHC is powered down right now. You might have to check me on that one. Do you know? Well, I saw one of our buddies that does work over at LHC. Yeah. Shout out to Red One. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, he's, Shout over, out. he's over there. <laughs> um, and he's looks like he's taking a vacation, so I don't think it's on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think they're powered down. Yeah, I think yeah, they're yeah. powered down. Yeah, yeah. So with that, I think they should be increasing their energy scales. Mm -hmm. So for, this, for the supersymmetry people out there, the string theorists, I guess they will be hoping that the LHC with its new energies, if it is being upgraded, mm -hmm. will be able to find the resolution necessary to be able to find some of these supersymmetric particles. Right. So the nice thing about um, pro about uh, LHC collisions and proton collisions, or or uh, I, I forget, what they did they collide gold or protons? I forget now. I don't know. Whatever. So they collide some particle. With these collisions, as long as the energies are high enough, you're going to get any possible particles to come out there. Because yeah. all particles exist within whatever the energies um, that you collide. Um, I mean, you're getting the fundamental, like the electrons you're getting. Yeah, like neutrons, particles can pop in and out of existence. Protons. Like this has been shown um, experimentally as well as theoretically. Any particles should be able to exist as long as the energy scale is, as long as it's within the energy scale, right? From, from the ether. Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> tongue in cheek. Tongue from in the cheek. vacuum, I guess you could yeah, say. Yeah, no, it's from the like vacuum. That. Yeah, it's vacuum yeah. energy, um, which is cool. That's yeah, one thing is. that I did re that I, when I read uh, when I was taking this quantum anybody course, the vacuum energy uh, stuff was super interesting because I was like, mm -hmm. wow. Because I mean, they they are. I mean, fundamentally, yes, there is a vacuum energy in a sense that. You know the cosmic microwave background radiation yeah, yeah, yeah. is is sort of it's like a minimal energy yeah in yeah, the yeah. universe yeah so but it's just interesting that um the, yeah that you have particles pop up to try to conserve some sense of um, how would you say well it's energy conservation yeah. basically right I yeah. mean that's this is like what people say when they're like um, fundamental principles of the e equals mc squared yeah because it's like if your energy is enough if you're if you're literally creating these explosions that are such high energy, mm -hmm. the conversion from energy to mass, it's the mass and energy can be converted back and forth. Mm -hmm. So as long as the energy is not lost, it can, it's not being lost. It just can be converted into a mass. So you can literally create particles out of just pure energy, cool. um, which sounds like some fanciful fucking hippie shit, but it actually is real <laughs> <laughs> yeah. magic. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. So those are two of the big parts of, um, the problem slash um, unknown areas of of string theory, supersymmetry, yeah. and then those dim and those higher dimensions, right? Um, well, since we're on the topic, I want to yeah. I want to um, just kind of briefly talk a, a little bit about the problem stuff. What, what I've read so far, it seems to me that the experimental constraints. One workaround that a lot of string theories are trying to find is is they're trying to relate theory that's already been established within string theory of course to already valid validated experimental data right mm -hmm. so they're trying to find ways to connect their abstract theory into the observable stuff yeah right of course, that's like a lot of homework for a lot of these guys because yeah. <laughs> you have to find ways to val uh, at least validate logically how you would you could test these things um yeah or stat or or connected to already established theories in in a very undeniably 
how would you say? Uh, it's it, an undeniable way. Yeah, undeniable yeah. way. There's no other way to put it. Yeah. I think the hard thing about that is that with string theory, it's already shown that it it will re- it reproduces like things like quantum mechanics and stuff. Right. That's one of the allures of it, right? And it and it aligns well with like GR general relativity and and uh, it it, rep- it reproduces um, a lot of stuff that already exists. But the problem is we already know those exist, right? Mm-hmm. So really, the thing the test is. Can we confirm anything that's new that string theory predicts? Right, and that has to do with things like the ten, the eleven dimensions, the um, supersymmetry. Mm-hmm. So you need to have things that are like brand new from string theory that are getting um, predicted. There's some other things with axions that I really wish I got a chance to research more, and I don't know anything about them. But I know we have some friends, uh, uh, actually uh, someone we know. I think. Oh, actually, uh, I, I think Irene has done some things with, with ax, axions. Cool. Irene is from the Beyond the Physics podcast. Mm-hmm. And Irene, if you're watching, um, confirm that for me. I don't know if that's true or not, but mm-hmm. I think I remember you mentioning that. Um, but axions are these particles that um, that I think came from string theory predictions. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, we need some things that, um, that string theory uniquely predicts mm-hmm. um, that can be confirmed. Yeah. Which nothing has yet, so it needs and really is in dire need of some experimental help, yeah. big time. Yeah, this will more more than likely be. I was we were discussing it. This will probably more than likely be a discussion series. Yeah, on string theory because there, like you're saying, there's so many subtypes of theories. Unformally, huh? Unformally, uh, a discussion series because we're not gonna say like it's part one of two or right, right, yeah. right, right, right. We're gonna as we come to it, I'm sure we'll talk about it again. For sure, for sure. <laughs> but uh, but no, I want to bring somebody who's like actually studied this stuff. Maybe maybe talk to um. Well, the thing is, nobody at our school does string theory. No, I know, but there are people that there are people in the math department that study these like manifolds, and it's kind of va- it's more mathematical physics in in that, right. thing, in that lens. But well, we got quantum. We got field theorists, though. We do that are actually pretty adjacent to to string theory. Very true. The thing is, like a lot of these, if you're doing physics and you want to study this high level theory stuff, you will more than likely be pushed out into mathematical physics. Um, meaning, but that's where all the big stuff is. Meaning, right? meaning you'll be pushed into the math department. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the more math, high order stuff, like if you know group theory and you know like topology, yeah. gauge theory. Um, all these things are going to become relevant to you if you're studying, if you're on the bleeding edge of like trying to figure out grand unified theories and things like that. Um, you definitely want to go down that trail yeah. if that's the case. Like our, our good friend Jesse, a uh, friend of the show who studies at Penn State, he's he's in that, he's in that camp. Mm-hmm. He studies um, like basically uh, these higher level stuff that, that is mostly pushed into the math department. Yeah. Like he can't study this at the physics department. Right. You're climbing up the ivory tower. <laughs> yeah. The mathematicians are like, come join us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's kind of interesting how you see this divergence because I do see a lot of academics that are, that functionally know this level of, of physics. Mm-hmm. I think a lot, there's a quite a number of physicists in our department that know. Yeah, like the field theorists in our department would definitely be able to, to cross into this regime i'm sure of it yeah and the thing is but largely it's it's just kind of interesting that they still teach that i mean i don't know do you think well i guess um i guess they still need to teach field theories because uh well yeah because field theory is actually has experimental confirmation things like of course one of the big ones is the alpha um the fine structure constant. Course, yeah. I mean, it's got like 13 decimals of pre- precision. It's insane. Yeah. yeah. So um, quantum field theory is pretty damn solid, mm-hmm. even despite the renormalization stuff. You know, um, a lot of physicists famously didn't like it too much, like Dirac um, specifically. But um, yeah, it's because it wasn't beautiful enough. <laughs> right. Dirac's yeah. his, and his beauty. But I'm like, Dirac, bro, you come up with some crazy wild idea yeah <laughs> <laughs> but no respect to Dirac he's, he's he's the mensch the he uber is. mensch but um you know truly you um yeah the quantum field theory is a is a experimentally confirmed theory very well experimentally confirmed theory so it's gonna stay um and that's why it's taught everywhere and you know nationally or mm-hmm. actually internationally as well. Mm-hmm. So th- string theory is just not complete yet. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and people are thinking it's not going to be complete because it's still just stagnant now to this day. Yeah, I heard, uh, well, in this particular book here that I was kind of scanning a little bit before the podcast, um, this one's called Super Strings and the Search for the Theory of Everything by David Peat mm-hmm. and a P-E-A-T. Uh, he talks about how we've reached this uh, era of postmodern physics. Mm. So we, modern physics was, you know, in the 70s. <laughs> it's old news. <laughs> yeah. But now we're postmodern physics where, we're, yeah, we're in this regime of abstraction where experimentalists can't catch up. We don't we don't have the mechanical prowess yet or the right. to, to to really validate a lot of these high level theories. And I mean you kinda had that early on, you know, I guess uh what was it? In the nineteen twenties where you had some some theorists make certain predictions that weren't validated until fifty years later or so. Yeah. Yeah. This is this seems well, to Higgs be, is a good example his, of that. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. He literally just got you know, the Nobel Prize from yeah. the discovery, you know, was it back in like 2012 or something? or tw- Yeah, 2012, yeah. Okay. About a decade ago. Yeah, but he made that prediction so long ago. Yeah. So. And that's how it's going to be. It's going to be like that for, for a good while until mm-hmm. our engineering catches up or maybe our funding gets better for scientific mm-hmm. uh, endeavors. So. Yeah, but string theory, um, it's an interesting one, man. Um, it's It's got some ways to go for sure. Um and I mean, they even they can't even complete it. I don't think, which is um, why, um, because I think it's still an effective field theory. I'm not sure if it's actually completed. Mm. Actually, don't don't uh, let me rescind Unt- that until we I, get until yeah, we get an actual. String my information theory. is not completely uh, is not completely there yet for that. I don't know if if string theory is completed theory or not. Um, yeah, but this is sort of a, an introduction. Maybe we can we, we'll bring on some more people that that can discuss string theory at, at a more um, I guess rigorous level, maybe even like the history Hopefully. and, and uh, I don't know any string theorists. I think I know somebody. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I think I know one or two people <laughs> that could discuss this ad nauseum if even. Okay. Yeah. If we got somebody by all means, <laughs> yeah, yeah. cause I don't, what's the um, time? What are we looking at? 45. Okay, cool. Solid 45, okay, cool. I think. But, um, but yeah. yeah, is there anything else that you want to add on? Anything new or interesting that you learned from your, well, I learned a shitload about this. Um, you know, I didn't, didn't have this much of a knowledge of string theory because the last time I really looked at string theory was probably when I was, you know, a kid who was in undergraduate, you know, Mm -hmm. so I didn't have any concept of some of these higher level things. Mm -hmm. So I couldn't really give that good of a description. Um, I used to know, actually, this is even before I got into physics because I used to like watching just Michio Kaku and, Mm -hmm. you know, Neil deGrasse Tyson and all these guys talk about it. Brian Mm -hmm. Green. Mm -hmm. I guess Neil doesn't really talk about it, but Brian Green and, and Kaku, but, um, I remember asking a physicist when I was in my second college or something, my or my third college, <laughs> one of those. <laughs> mm-hmm. I had a little rocky start in <laughs> school. Um, I remember asking one of the guys, and he's like, and I asked him, what's the problem with string theory? Why do people always talk about it? And uh, he said, because there's a problem with the Lagrangian. Um, it doesn't It doesn't fit the Lagrangian model or something. So I don't know what he meant by that, and I still don't know what he meant by that because even when I researched it, I didn't know what what they what the problem with the Lagrangian is. But apparently, so I think the theory is not complete. I think there's some issue with the Lagrangian. He's like, if it's better with the Ronskian or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think the Lagrangian is just not complete somehow, mm. because field theorists all they do basically is they're finding Lagrange densities. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't even know if he meant Lagrange density. I assume so. Um, so I think the Lagrangian is still not yet to be found. So Lagrangian, once you have that, that's everything, right? Of course. So I think it's just incomplete. Gotcha. Um, but yeah. Um, yeah, anything. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, I guess, uh, you know, I still have to finish this book and we still have to add <laughs> so I can add True. to this discussion a lot more, but, uh, but we will for but sure be talking. Do you have any other questions? questions? Not really. I mean, no? just, just. I mean, this. Is, I mean, I, I kind of knew like certain things because of the class, but we didn't really touch. Obviously, you don't touch on string theory because it's not really a valid theory just yeah, yet. Yeah. So we only touch on things once it's been experimentally confirmed exactly, at a pretty high exactly. level, yeah. and then we're pretty sure it's going to be right. Yeah, but actually, I want to give a. I, I do want to give a shout out to PBS. Um, space, this, time. space time. Space mm-hmm. Yeah. They have a pretty decent series on the, the normal size theory. Peter Dinklage guy, whatever his yeah, name is. Yeah. <laughs> I forget. No disrespect, man, but but like he's he's actually he's he's great. He's um 
check out the channel. They do talk about string theory, why it, why it's appealing, and then why it's wrong. Yeah, so, actually, that was a really good um, channel for me to get myself brushed up on. Mm. Because he said, yeah, he literally said why one of his videos was why string th string theory is right and then why string theory is wrong, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it was a nice like good sixteen seven minute video seventeen minute video, mm -hmm. so it's it's very enlightening. So um, yeah, go ahead and watch those. Shout out to them. Yeah. Um, and yeah, the I guess that's it, right? That's it. Yeah. Damn, this is gonna be a short podcast. Yeah, it's fifty minutes. <laughs> I think. I think. 10 minutes. I can't really add anything new. Okay. So Unless yeah, you can. Yeah, it's true. <laughs> no, I mean, we don't need to stretch it out artificially anyway, so that's Not fine. Not true. <laughs> but yeah, um, I guess stick around for the outro. We'll, we'll have a question for you. Excellent. Mm -hmm. Hey. Hey. Thank you for making it this far <laughs> into the Super String Theory, well, String Theory episode. Um, no, you're right. It's because Super String Theory is the main one. So. Oh, okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Super String Theory. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for making it this far. Um we would like for you to comment. At least I would like for you to comment. Um, you know, if there are any good docs that you've seen on string theory for the folks. Um, leave them below, guys. Leave them, leave them below. below. And for those of you listening to audio only, go ahead and check out a YouTube page and subscribe. Yes, yes, please. That will help us. Um, and me and Juan are trying to roll out some more things in the future, hopefully. Yeah. We also have a Patreon, if you don't know. you can, is, it, is it based on, is it set up on like just, uh, just like whatever amount they want to pay? Yeah, yeah. Okay, good. But you can pay a dollar. Just pay a dollar. That's all we need. Or two cents. One penny for Terrence, one penny for me. <laughs> Hopefully at least a dollar, guys. Yeah, Come yeah. on. <laughs> for, the, for the cost of, what are those commercials for to supporting? For like animals. <laughs> well, no, supporting, yeah, supporting like uh, a certain foundation of yeah. or like poor children in third world countries. For the feed cost, one eigenbro. Feed one eigenbro <laughs> for just the the cost of a cup of coffee. <laughs> yeah. You can feed a wagon bro for a month. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you can. Legitimately. You should, you should see how me and Terrence live. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, guys, um, shout out for the Patreon subscriber that yes. we have. Uh, Black Thoughts, thank you once again. And are, are you? Uh, I think it's just Black Thoughts now. Oh, no. <laughs> we lost one. Yeah, but that's okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think he paid. Actually, I think he maybe paid for the month. We still got to figure out this whole thing. So we'll give Arya we Krisha a shout out still too. Yeah, yeah. But um, thank you guys. Thank you both. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, guys, make sure you check out our Patreon as well. We're also going to look for um, forward to doing some things maybe with YouTube memberships as well. So stay tuned for that. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, guys, make sure to like, share, subscribe, comment mm -hmm. as always. And then check us out at eigenbros.com. Eigenbros on Instagram. Eigenbros on uh Twitter, sorry, mm -hmm. brain fart, and then I can bros too on TikTok. Yep. See you guys later.